As a reminder, always seek out training from the shop supervisor or the technical director before attempting any task or demonstrations in this video. If you have never performed a task that I discuss or demonstrate, especially if it is one of the more advanced tasks or operations, you should only attempt them under the supervision of the shop supervisor or the technical director, especially if it is your first time doing so. If you haven't done something recently or would like a refresher, ask to be retrained or have the shop supervisor or technical director supervise you performing the task. As always, be safe in the shops, on stage or backstage, or in the production support areas. In this video, we're going to be talking about portable and cordless drills and impact drivers. Drills are going to look like this or like this. This one's a little heavier. This one's going to be a little bit lighter. So that's also a choice in which one you want to use depending on your project. Um, if you're trying to keep it steady and doing a lot of fine drilling, you probably don't want to use this heavy one. You want to find a lighter one so that you can keep it straight and you don't twist the drill and break bits. These two are impact drivers. We'll talk about the differences in a minute. And we also have a right angle impact driver. Same principle, same difference, but it is a right angle impact driver. These are our bins of standard bits. The most common one you're going to use is the number two Phillips bit. Get used to seeing that and recognizing it and putting them back in that bin. And there's some countersink bits here, some bit holders there, and there are now some T25 Torx bits because some of the drywall and construction screws are now coming in T25 Torx bits and they're star head and they actually grip a little bit better than Phillips and they're a little bit easier to use. This is a number two drill bit. And you can tell it's a number two by the size of the tip. The others are, I've separated them into this separate container. You have to hunt down the separate container and you kind of need to know where what you're doing uh, when you go for them. But there are uh, number ones, number twos, and number threes. You will most likely be using the number two. The number two has the right size for most of the drywall screws and construction screws that we use. The number one has a tinier tip on it and is used for smaller screws uh, with smaller heads that uh, this won't fit into. And then the number three is even bigger head for larger screws number 10, number 12, number 14, and that size of screws. You need to use the appropriate screw driving bit for the size of screw that you're using. They are not determined by color. This one is gold. This is a different brand. It's a Milwaukee with a red middle, a black shank, and a silver tip. This one's also gold. This number two is gold. This one is silver or bluish silver and this one's uh, darker gray. So they, they are just colored by the manufacturer and the style, not color coded by size. These three numbers match up with your standard screwdriver. This is a number three Phillips screwdriver. This is a number two Phillips screwdriver. This is a number one Phillips screwdriver. And often they will be marked on the handle. Three point. Your standard drywall screw takes a number two. It's a standard drywall screw is a number eight screw and it fits in nice and smoothly. It's tight, it doesn't wobble around that's a good fit. If you use the number one, you'll notice that it wobbles around a lot. And because it wobbles around a lot, you're likely going to strip the screw or strip the bit. And you'll notice the number three doesn't fit in there at all. You probably just need to remember this. The number one bit is usually for size six screws, although this one feels like it might also fit a number two bit, yes it does. This number six screw is good for a number two. The number eight screw is good for number two. 
But the minute you move up to number 10, the head is bigger, and you put the number two in, and now the number two bit wobbles around. So that's when you need to go up to the number three bit, because the number three bit fits nice and snugly. Yeah, this is where if you definitely use a number two bit in, the, in the, the screw size for the number three bit, it's going to strip out the screw head. So that was number 10. This is number 12 with the three bit, number three bit. And this is a size 14 screw with a number three bit. How do you know what size your screw is? Well, we have a handy little gauge here in the tool room by the tape measure. This is the number six. This one was a number eight. This one is number 10, fits nicely in the number 10 slot. This was the number 14, which actually coincides also with the quarter inch. Um, this gauge does not have a number 12. When I said the drywall screws were eight, they might actually be six. And then you've got all the different sizes for your different size bolts. You've got your metrics. You've got all these different features. So this is a handy gauge when you're trying to figure out what's what. Putting those away, we're not gonna use those today but you need to know what they are, where they come from, where they go. Safety operating procedures are posted on the tool or next to the tool. These procedures represent the most important safety operations and considerations while using this tool or equipment, but are not intended to be comprehensive coverage of every possible use. For more complete safety instructions, please refer to the tool and equipment user manuals. Do not use this machine unless you have been instructed in its safe use and operations and you are complying with college and departmental shop safety guidelines and procedures. Safety glasses are recommended eye protection while operating this tool, but standard safety practice should be to always wear safety glasses while working in the scene shop or on stage for scenic lighting, painting, or similar work calls of any kind. Hearing protection is required for some operations, such as when the tool is on hammer drill settings, and for extended use, especially during extended use of impact drivers or for any use of the rotary hammer drill. Long or loose hair, neckties, and loose or baggy clothing must be contained. Roll up long sleeves, tuck in your shirt. Tie back or tie up hair. Long hair can become entangled in the moving parts of the drill. Keep hair away from the drill and chuck while operating the tool. A dust mask or respirator may be required for some operations. Gloves should not be worn while operating this tool. Rings, watches, and loose jewelry should not be worn. Pre-operational safety checks. Locate and ensure you are familiar with all machine operations and controls. Controls and adjustments may vary from tool to tool, particularly among different manufacturers of the same type of tool. Inspect cords for damage or wear when using a portable drill with a power cord. Be sure that the trigger actuates properly. It should operate smoothly and return to the off position when released. If the tool is equipped with a trigger lock, Make sure it releases properly before plugging it in or before installing a battery. Some tools come with a trigger lock and the trigger lock allows you to pull the trigger and if you squeeze the trigger and you push that trigger lock in, then when you release the trigger, it stays locked and it keeps running the whole time until you depress the trigger a second time and it releases. That's handy if you're going to be doing a lot of work with the tool over and over again, and you don't want to just be squeezing and compressing the trigger the whole time. Your hand's going to go tired and, and the trigger locks are a handy thing. They don't really make the trigger locks for tools that are cordless. They usually are only for tools that have cords. And here we have a really poorly coiled cable. So we're going to fix that while we're here. all nice and tidy. 
No one's picking up after you in the scene shop, so you have to pick up after yourself. And you have to keep the place clean and feel like it's a place that people want to come to and work. Always unplug the tool or remove the battery before changing bits. If the tool uses a chuck key, be sure to remove the chuck key before powering the tool. If you don't, it could go flying in your face or at someone else across the room. Use the auxiliary handle when it is installed, especially with the hammer drill operations. The secondary handle provides additional control when drilling into materials that could cause the bit to bind and twist the tool out of your hands. Use extra caution when drilling blindly, where you are drilling into a surface and you cannot see the inside or the other side of the material. An example would be drilling into a wall that might have electrical wiring inside. Keep your finger off of the trigger switch when carrying the tool. You don't want to accidentally actuate the trigger. The drill bit or other attachment could behave erratically and cause you or someone else injury. The first thing you need to know is how to tell the difference between a cordless drill and a cordless impact driver. A cordless drill is going to look something like this. It's going to uh, have uh, a chuck that, that you have to open up and insert bits and tighten down by hand. This one's called a keyless chuck. That means it doesn't require a key. It's a chuck without a key, so keyless. And uh, you hand tighten it when it bites down around the bit. It, it, it locks down and starts snapping like that. The uh, impact driver has a different kind of keyless chuck, but it's a quick release chuck, and it's quick release designed for a very special hex key bit with this little indentation. And that little indentation is what allows it to go in and catch. You open that up, you pull it out, and then the bit comes out. You pull that out and you slide the bit in, and when you release, it locks and it doesn't come out. Some of them have an automatic lock, and this is one of those. When you push it in, it locks. You don't have to hold it. You just have to pull it out to, to extricate it. Here's another one, a different kind of bit. And that one does not have an automatic lock. So I have to pull that forward and push it in and lock it. The cordless drills also have additional controls. They have a torque setting, which goes down from a low number all the way up to a high number, and sometimes it ends with a drill symbol. This one has uh, three symbols here. That's a little hammer symbol. That's for hammer drill. That's a screw symbol. That's for the setting for when you're driving screws. And that's a drill symbol, and that's the setting for when you're driving, uh, using drills and drilling into material. It also has a number one and number two speed. Number two speed, number one speed. If you get this stuck in the middle, it's not going to work. It's going to just sort of ratchet around and ratchet around. So uh, be conscious of that, you know, when you're working under something, you slide and something might knock this out and then your tool will start malfunctioning. It just needs to be reset to number two or number one. The general guideline is if you're driving screws, you wanna be on number one for greater control and you're less likely to smash your fingers. If you are drilling into wood or uh, other soft materials, you wanna be on number two. Faster drilling means faster getting through stuff. If you're drilling into metal, you don't wanna be on number two because faster drilling means overheating the material, overheating the drill bit, and you will dull and destroy the drill bit. So then for metal, you want to be on number one. The drills can take all standard drill bits, but they can also take drill bits that have this hex key and this, the, the connection designed for the impact driver. So they can, they can use both of them. And you just put the drill bit in and you tighten it down until it clicks. Impact drivers, they only use this hex shank bit. Impact drivers can also use socket adapters, and this fits in the same way as the other one. And now you can tighten up nuts and bolts. The purpose of the impact driver is that as it's driving, it does this sort of ratcheting action. It goes chunk, 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 chunk really fast. 
And what it's doing is it's creating a, a repeated force of tightening, 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 tightening. And then as that resistance gets more, it, it knows to adjust and adapt and not go past a certain level of resistance. And then the same thing in taking it off, if you've got a really stubborn nut or bolt, the impact driver goes and then it un unloosens the, the bolt. You'll see these used a lot, not in this format, not in the cordless format, but in the uh, air powered format in the auto repair store when you're getting your tires changed and when they're doing other things, it's just faster for them. Uh, but especially the tires and the lug nuts, they use a, a, an air powered uh, pneumatic uh, impact driver attachment. It goes, so when you, see, when you go to get, to get your tires changed, you hear that, that's an impact driver. It's just like this. We are using these now more and more for driving screws just because they're faster and more efficient and more convenient. It's actually a little bit easier once you get the hang of it to drive screws with an impact driver than it is with a cordless drill. You can get drill bits that have the impact driver attachment. We have a few of them here and there, but not a lot. They're more expensive. And since we tend to go through a lot of drill bits, we usually buy the cheaper ones and the, uh, than the ones that fit the cordless drill rather than the impact driver. You can use the, these in the impact driver. You can actually put any hex key uh, of this quarter inch shank hex key uh, fitting inside the impact driver. But if you put one in that doesn't have the little notch in there, it's gonna go in, but it's not gonna stay in because it doesn't have that little notch to lock it into place. So then when you're drilling down, it could fall out and you don't want to do that. It's not a magnetic uh, attachment in there. A few of our impact drivers have a speed function and by pushing on the, this symbol to the left here, it will go from high, medium to slow. So it actually goes the other way around slow, medium, high, and then the trigger. Most of the cordless drills now come with uh, a, a, a light so you can see your work, especially in dark areas, but you also might need a flashlight um, in between because it only pops on when you pull the trigger and then it fades off in a few seconds. Operational safety checks. These are safety checks you must be aware of at all times while using the tool and you must check them and perform them every time you use the tool on every single operation or cut. Adjust the tool speed as needed to keep the bit cutting smoothly. Tools have variable speed triggers and cordless drills usually have at least two selectable speeds. Pre-drill holes for screws to prevent splitting of wood. When drilling with very small diameter drill bits, be aware that slight shifts in the tool could cause bits to break. Clamp down small pieces to prevent movement and to have greater control of your drilling. Keep your fingers, loose clothing, and especially long hair away from the rotating bit and chuck. Use extra caution when using hole saws and spade bits on portable drills. The tool may catch in the material, resulting in loss of control of the tool, especially if you shift the tool slightly off center or as you break through the other side of the lumber. If the drill bit binds in the work, release the trigger immediately. Set the tool to reverse to back out the drill and clear any debris. Once clear, you may proceed again. If the operation can potentially bind in the work, do not engage the trigger lock into the locked on position while operating. When drilling into metal, use cutting oil regularly to keep the drill bit and metal from overheating. We can do drywall screws with the drill, or we can uh, do drywall screws with the impact driver. It's more common these days that people are using them with the impact driver. It's got more force, it's got more, it's just faster. People are happier with it. So we're gonna use some drywall screws uh, with both of them. I'm gonna make this look easier than it is, but it does take a little bit of work and practice. With the cordless drill, you want to be on drill mode if you're driving screws, or you could be on screw mode. Actually, screw mode is where you wanna be. 
And then it's got a torque, usually from a low number to a high number. You want to be on the highest number when you're driving screws or drilling into wood. It's got a number two speed and a number one speed. If you're driving screws with your cordless drill, you want to be on low speed. If you're on the high speed, it's going to go around a lot faster and you're more likely going to slip and jam this bit into your finger while you're holding the screw. So you don't want to do that. There's the forward and backward. Thumb is backward. Right forefinger is uh, uh, forward. And some of them have a little light. The trigger is variable speed. So that means if you pull it a little bit, it goes slowly. If you pull it all the way, it goes very fast. This is with all cordless drills. Not necessarily all tools with a trigger, but many of them do, and that's a good thing because then you have control over it. The most common mistake that people do is that they just only do zero and full, zero and full when they're first starting out. Just practice getting a little bit of control there by pulling the trigger part way because you're gonna wanna go slowly at first. You do wanna hold the screw with your finger and you wanna not hold it too tight because the sharp little teeth will uh, you know, cut up your finger too. So you just you're just there, kind of like a balance to keep it steady. And then you go in and you slip like that. And if your fingers were there, I would have slammed that into my finger. So I do need to push down on the drill. If I'm not pushing down on the drill, then it just does this little skipping action. And if you're doing that skipping action, you're destroying the screw and you're destroying the screw bit. You don't want to do that. That's very, very bad. And then you reverse it, back it out. And you usually sink them slightly below the surface. And you can do the same thing with the impact driver. The difference with the impact driver is it's designed for tightening things with this little, it's got a ratchet sound. It goes ching, 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 ching. And it gets a little more torque on every tightening or loosening. And then they go and then the, so that's what's going on here and you need to recognize the difference between the actual natural ratcheting action of the tool versus the stripping action of the bit that's the good sound that's the bad sound just slipping. So again, you need to apply pressure. You need to put your body in a position where you can apply the pressure. The tool doesn't just magically drive the screw in. It does it with your muscle and your strength and your body weight. So you have to make it happen. That's the good sound. The drills do have some other functions. With the drill, the torque, what the purpose of the torque is, is that at, at the highest torque speed, I'm going to have the full force of the drill to, to drill things. If I turn the torque down, what that does is it tells the tool that after a certain amount of resistance, it's going to stop. And if I turn it all the way down, I can demonstrate this more quickly. I go like this and it, and just stop spinning. You need to know about the torque, even if you never use it, because you're gonna pick the drill up out of the tool crib, and someone's going to have left the torque on uh, number one, and you're gonna start driving screws or drilling into wood, and you're gonna go, why isn't it going? Why isn't it going? Well, you need to adjust the torque up higher. The torque is there if you're going into sensitive materials, thin sheet metal or plastics that you don't want to strip out and you want to tighten the screw down and you'll uh, get it to a certain point and then it'll stop. It's more likely that you're going to be doing this in the audio area than in most other areas because they're the ones that uh, are going into uh, audio racks and other pieces of equipment that you know you don't want to tear out uh, the threads built into the, into the machinery, into the, into the equipment. You got to know that that is there and when you're drilling or when you're driving screws into wood for set construction, you want it on the highest speed. This one goes, starts at one, and then it goes up to 16, and then it has two dashes, and then it has a drill mode. There's a lot of different variations here. When we put the drill in, 
we turn the chuck, we tighten the chuck down, and then you get it to a certain point and then you just hand crank it. And that's the easiest way to do it. People like to do that because they think it's easier and faster. And then when you put it in, you loosen it up, you tighten it up. But uh, you don't have a whole lot of control over that and just it, it's, it's easy enough to do with just hand tightening. Okay. You just tighten it up by hand and then you just give it a little extra crank. That's all it takes. You don't have to use the trigger. This one's on high speed. Sometimes high is forward and sometimes high is backward. It's just one and two, whatever is the highest speed. And then you just... This drill bit is a little bit dull. It should be easier to drill than that. Two is forward on this one. Slow speed or is back. 16, I'm gonna go on drill mode, which is the center one on this one. And if you're drilling, you just need to, sometimes you go in part way and then you need to back out so that some of the wood can fall, up and fall out. And that bit is pretty dull as well. Dull, dull, dull. The drill bits get abused and used and abused. Let's see if I can find a sharp one. That's a good one. It should be really nice and easy to drill into. You shouldn't have to fight it. If you're fighting it, uh, the drill bit is dull and you should get one that is not dull. The drill bits are sized here for going into certain bins. If you are putting them back, please put them back in the bin that they belong. You can't always read the size on here. So we have a gauge. A gauge that shows what size it is. So you just put it in there until the smallest one that it'll fit. And it doesn't go into the 1364, so it goes in the 730 seconds. 730 seconds is right here. I can tell when they're not in the right spot because they wobble. That one's not in the right spot. It was in the one quarter, and it's not one quarter. It's uh, also 730 seconds. So let's get them back in the right spot. That's also in the wrong spot, but that goes in the other tray. Countersink bit. We use these a lot with masonite. Masonite is too dense and too tough to just drive a screw through and have it sink in, not like the soft wood pine here. So we have to countersink it. And this countersink bit is designed to fit into the impact drivers. It's got that little notch. And you just uh, drill a hole until it's big enough until the head of a drywall screw will fit into it. Here's an actual piece of masonite. I don't want to drill a hole into the table. This is only a quarter inch thick, so it's not very thick, so you can't go through all the way, otherwise you'll just drive the screw through the surface of it. But uh, we go along the edge with this, and we go... Just like that. And we usually go about uh, six to eight inches apart, uh, depending on the size of the masonite. Masonite, actually, we go uh, on a four foot side, we'll do uh, one in each corner, and then uh, two or three, uh, one in the middle, and then one more on each side. So that's actually uh, a little bit bigger than six to eight inches apart. But um, six to eight inches apart is standard for screwing a lid of a plywood. Uh, onto a platform. That's pretty standard for that. So we're just going to do six, in, six to eight inches here just for the sake of a, you know, example. And then when you're driving the screws, usually you're going to use the one inch or the one and a quarter inch screws to attach your masonite to your platform. And now 
we went through the, the wood. So you can kind of see that. Nice and flush. And you want that to be flush because you don't want shoes tripping on your uh, decking of your stage. If you're doing some stage combat or some sort of acrobatics or something that's a little more physical, you don't want your actors rolling around on the stage and getting torn up by drywall screw heads. So you need to get that screw below the surface of the masonite. These are potential hazards to be aware of while operating this tool. Losing control of the tool is one of the most common hazards. Allowing the drill to drift slightly left or right can cause drill bits to bind and or to break. Losing control of the workpiece is also likely, especially if the piece is not secured to a table, a workbench, or to part of the set. When drilling into metal, your skin and eyes can come into contact with cutting oil and sharp metal shavings. When drilling into wood, your eyes can come into contact with sawdust and splintered wood or chips. Eye injuries can occur due to flying wood, metal, or other debris. Wearing eye protection can help prevent eye injuries from flying debris. Drill bits and other attachments can become hot when drilling, when driving screws, or when tightening bolts. Screws and bolts may also become hot. Make sure parts have cooled before touching them. Do not use faulty equipment. If something is not working properly, or if you suspect something is wrong with the tool or machine, please report this to your instructor and or to the ANL technical director. Do not carry tools by their power cord. This puts additional stress on the cord and can cause damage to the wiring, resulting in tool failure or injury to the operator. Never mill your material with drill bits. Do not cut with the sides of the drill bits. They are designed for forward cuts only. Do not try to enlarge or ream out a hole with this kind of action. Do not touch shavings or chips. They may be hot. Drill bits may be hot after use. Avoid touching or handling them until they have had time to cool down. Do not force the drill. Drill bits should cut without the operator applying excessive force. If you do have to use excessive force, most likely your drill bit is dull. Replace it with a sharp drill bit. Also, check the tool to make sure you are using forward and not reverse on the drill. You won't get very far trying to use drill bits in reverse. Do not dispose of hot metal in the general waste bins. Use the hot trash bucket located on the grinder table. Housekeeping. Remove all drill bits and accessories from the tool after each use and before putting away in the tool cage. So as we're putting tools away in the drill area, you can leave any of your screw bits in, your number two screw bits in, because we use those all the time. But when you're putting them away, if they have a drill bit in them, uh, take the drill bit out. These two were dull, I'm gonna throw them away. This one was still good, so we'll put that one away. You do not need to charge the batteries at the end of every day. Just charge them when they're dead. Don't bother putting them in the charger every single day, all the time, over and over and over again. Wait till they're dead and put them in the charger. They say these batteries aren't supposed to have memory, but they do have a maximum number of charges that they can do. So the more often you charge them, the more you use up those charges and the more you expend the life of the battery. So with all the cordless tools, you can keep the, the battery in the tool, put the tool away in its slot. They are numbered. This one is uh, cordless drill number 10, CD10. It's got set the numbers on a couple of different places, CD10. So put the cordless drills in the slots numbered uh, appropriately. This is cordless drill 12. So that goes in slot number 12. This is cordless drill 11, CD11. This is ID12, impact driver 12. So that goes in ID12 slot. ID11, put it in its slot. ID6, put it in its slot. And some of them, we've also labeled them underneath here because sometimes the numbers get rubbed off and the markings get rubbed off in those other locations. Do not dispose of hot metal in the general waste bins. Use the hot trash bucket located on the grinder table. Pick up waste material immediately. After each cut, pick up your scraps and off-cut material and place it in a trash receptacle. 
Sweep up sawdust regularly to keep the floor from becoming a slip hazard. Dust off counters and tables. Vacuum areas as needed. This is the drywall screw container uh, cart. The bins are labeled, as are the, the shelves. This is for one inch drywall screws. This is for one and a quarter inch drywall screws. This is for one and five eighths, the most common size you will use. This is for two inch, and that's for two and a half and three. People like to just dump everything everywhere. And I can just take this handful of uh, screws here and I can see that they are all inch and five eighths and someone just dumped them in the wrong bin. They belong in this bin. Um, there's more of them here. You need to be able to differentiate between the different sizes and for some reason these three sizes are very hard for people to tell the difference between. One inch, one and a quarter inch, one and five eighths inch. Two inch, two and a half inch, three inch. Those are the six sizes. Don't put them in the wrong bin, please. Put them in the right bin. And then, it's labeled here, do not save used drywall screws. At strike, don't collect all the drywall screws and put them back in the bin. Throw them directly into the trash. If you're working on a show during the day, uh, building sets, don't uh, put your spent screws back in the bin. Throw them directly into the trash. You may return unused drywall screws if you sort them out into the six sizes and put them back in the bin that they belong in. There are three reasons why we don't save drywall screws. The first is that they are coated with oil when they come out of the factory, and that's to keep them from rusting, and the oil uh, coating that helps the drywall screws bite into the wood easier the first time, and it's easier for them to drill. After you've used them once, all that coating is gone, and then they have a harder time driving into wood the second, third, and fourth, and et cetera, fifth time. The second reason we don't use them over again is because they're more likely to break on the second and third and fourth usage. And the last thing you want to do is to be building your set or striking your set with used drywall screws that are breaking left and right. I mean, things aren't coming apart because the screws are breaking off inside the lumber because they've been used three or four times. Uh, that's going to slow you down and it's going to create more hassle and headache and it's just not going to be a happy thing. And third, the screw heads get filled in with paint when we build sets. And they're just not usable. So we don't need them. So throw them away. They're cheap. A big uh, bucket of drywall screws is, is cheaper than the amount of labor it takes to sort them out and keep them and reuse them and fight with them when they're full of paint and when they keep breaking off. So throw them out.